All right, well, welcome to week two. Week two of our time together, uh, checking out what Christianity is all about. This week we're going to be talking about the Bible. Um, as we start to go through Christianity and uh, start to get into some of the uh, deeper understandings of what Christians believe and why they believe it, well, uh, one of the most important things is that we understand what the Christian view of the Bible is. Um, if you were to talk to Christians today, you would find people really kind of on both ends of the spectrum. Some people would say that the Bible is the absolute divinely inspired, uh, matter of fact, might as well have been written down by God himself, word of God. There are others on the opposite end of the spectrum who would say the Bible is kind of a, a useful book, but there are flaws in it and we don't necessarily um, think that it should be held on quite the level that the people on the other end of the spectrum uh, think of it. So uh, as we talk about the Bible, uh, it's important for us to recognize uh, exactly what it is as far as what most Christians would probably think. Uh, so usually I have this little activity that we do. I have you get into a couple groups and just think about some sort of superhero, uh, your own creation. If you were going to sit down, Marvel Comics comes to you one day and says, we're going to offer you $50 million to create a brand new superhero for us, but it's got to be a really good superhero. Um, what is it that you would put into that? What is it that uh, you would uh, make kind of its defining characteristics and that kind of thing? Um, now let's actually move that and say that uh, you have... <laughs> you have a bunch of writers all in a room and all of them have to come up with the same different superhero. Uh, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. And uh, and you can see, even when you look at something like, uh, like Batman or Spider-Man or any of these characters that have been around for a long, long time, um, as you watch them grow and change throughout the comics, there are things that they do now that they would never have done when they were first created. For instance, uh, Superman was created in the uh, 1930s, and when he was created, Superman had the ability to jump really, really high. <laughs> but over time, Superman gained the ability to fly. That was something that wasn't part of the original writer's plan. Uh, so the characters in these comic books change over time as new writers come in and they start to uh, work with those characters and they start to um, put their own kind of spin on things. And so naturally, when we have so many people who have contributed to what we now view as one book, we would expect that the characters would change over time. That main character would change over time. Uh, so... Uh, let's check that out. Let's see what the Bible actually is. Um, so when we are given a question like, what is God like? Um, interestingly, it seems like all the biblical authors gave pretty much the same answer to that question. Um, they said that God is compassionate, that God is kind, that God is loving, God is merciful. Uh, and these kinds of uh, major characteristics are consistent across all these different authors uh, and across thousands of years of history. So you'll actually see right there uh, in the PowerPoint that the Bible was composed over uh, by over 40 different authors uh, who lived over the period of about 1,400 years. Now that's nuts as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, if that's like me trying to write something um, and it, and trying to make it consistent with uh, something that a, a Roman wrote 1,400, 1,500 years ago. That's just not going to happen. Um, that's like me trying to describe something in the exact same way that a Roman would have. It wouldn't happen. It's not a thing. So I think part of why people in Christianity say that the Bible is a divinely inspired book is because people across cultural perspectives 
uh, actually came to the topic of what is God like and basically answered it in the same way. Now think about even today, not even, not even talking about just the historical differences there, but today, if you were to be in conversation with someone from Nigeria, do you think that you would describe th things in the exact same way that they did? We, do, we recognize that cultural perspectives are so vastly different that it really doesn't make any sense that um, people from all these different cultures uh, and different angles would describe God in the same way. So if you come from uh, an African culture, it tends to be that uh, Africa, African cultures tend to focus more on um, the power of God um, in these cultures where uh, power is, is a big deal. Uh, they tend to focus more on the fact that God is a powerful God. In our culture, for instance, uh, in the United States of America, we tend to focus on the fact that God is merciful. Uh, we tend to focus on the fact that God is compassionate and loving because um, we recognize that we have a lot of things that we need to be forgiven for. Um, and so that tends to be our emphasis. There are different emphases uh, on kind of who God is and his primary characteristics really throughout the world. Um, and even now, it's interesting to have conversations with folks who are from different cultural perspectives uh, about what they see in the Bible. Uh, Ravi Zacharias was a theologian uh, who worked in the United States for a number of years. And as Ravi Zacharias talked about... Um, some of the cultural perspectives that he understood because he grew up in India. Um, he said, you know, one of the things that we look at in something like the story of the prodigal son uh, in the Gospels is that in Indian culture, um, the prodigal son basically spat in his father's face. And uh, any father who was in that kind of uh, so that kind of culture of honor, where your honor is a big deal. Any father would look at that and they'd go, no, he's not coming back. Um, and yet, what's so scandalous about that story of the prodigal son is that that father not only welcomes him, but celebrates the son's return. Um, that cultural perspective is completely different than what we would do in the West. We would look at that story and we would go, well, clearly he's, he's glad that his son is back. And there wouldn't be a whole lot more to it than that for many of us. So different cultural perspectives would naturally offer us uh, different views on what a text is saying. And so uh, it's very interesting that all of these texts across all of these cultures would still end up at the end of the day saying, God is this way. Um, so then you'll also see that the Bible was written in three different languages. It was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Uh, you want to know that it was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, you only find Aramaic in some of the later books of the Old Testament, like Daniel. Um, Hebrew is obviously the language of the Jewish people at this time, and so they um, they wrote to their own people. Uh, but it was also written in Greek, uh, most specifically what we call Koine Greek. You only know the specific Greek. Um, but Koine Greek was the common Greek. It was the language of the people. Um, it was kind of the uh, commonly used form of Greek across the empire. And so... Um, as the Bible is being written, it's written in the language of the people. And we find that uh, it makes a whole lot of sense for that to be the case. Because um, initially the Old Testament is written for the Jewish people. Um, and the idea is that the Jewish people would receive that word of God and that they would then take that and um, spread it to the people around them. But that's not what they do. Then, by the time we get to the New Testament, and by the time Christ himself has appeared, uh, we would say that 
uh, the Gentiles, who will be basically anybody outside of the Jewish faith, uh, so we would be considered Gentiles, basically anybody outside of the Jewish faith is welcomed in to receive the Jewish Messiah, who is the Christ. So the, uh, the New Testament is written in the language of the common people. Uh, it's written so that it can reach out to everybody. Um, and by that time, the Old Testament had also been translated into uh, Greek. So uh, it's written in multiple languages, uh, but at the same time, uh, all of them come together to make that one book. Again, we say that the message remains the same. So um, those of us who would be... Um, most theologians would actually say, that, yes, the Bible is divinely inspired. Uh, scripture will talk about this idea that, um, that Scripture is uh, God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness uh, from 2 Timothy. Um, the idea is that every word that comes from this book is considered to be divinely inspired. Now, there's kind of an interesting balance there because, yes, at the same time, human beings were the ones who wrote down these words. God worked through lawmakers like Moses. Uh, God worked through prophets uh, like Isaiah or Jeremiah. Uh, they were the ones who wrote down the words themselves. But at the same time, uh, we would say that God was the one who inspired those words. Um, that's really the only way we can kind of make sense of why we would get that same message across 1,400 years of human history, all packed into one book. So, uh, several of these books probably began as oral tradition. Uh, oral tradition meaning that uh, people across cultures and across times, uh, they would just uh, receive some sort of divine word and they would pass it down to the next generation and they would pass it down to the next generation. Uh, the book of Job is especially um, supportive of this idea that these books began as oral traditions. Um, because we look at something like you probably studied the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, in high school and uh, those were epic poems. Those were things that uh, somebody basically would have performed over time. They would have memorized that whole thing, and then they would have taken it, and they would have uh, performed it for the Greek culture around them. Um, it looks like, from what our scholarship uh, has discerned, it looks like the Book of Job and other such books actually began as those oral traditions, uh, began as things that people just memorized and then recited for those around them. Um, we would also say that most likely, even those first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, those are probably those were probably originally oral traditions, uh, and it's not as surprising when you consider that uh, these were the laws that the people had to live by, and they were not in a society that was text-based. Uh, we are so used to books. We're so used to being able to look up whatever we want to find. But at the time when these laws that Moses gave were given, you had to be able to just memorize these things. They didn't, um, they didn't necessarily read. There were people who were uh, specially educated to be able to write things down and, and read. Um, so you didn't have a book that you could just go to and um, and pick out whatever it was that you needed to know. You had to actually remember all of these things. So uh, the law is written in such a way uh, that you are supposed to be able to memorize it pretty easily. Um Wisdom books as well are probably intended to be memorized, especially books like the Proverbs. Uh, it's intended to be something that you just take in and remember. Uh, so a lot of these books probably started out as oral tradition and then were finally written down. Uh, and we'll talk some more about that um, later on in the semester. Uh, 
Some of these books also were originally written as letters. Uh, they were just uh, in written form from the very beginning, especially the works of Paul. Uh, especially once we get into the New Testament. A lot of New Testament books uh, were always letters. We actually have uh, a sermon. Uh, the book of Hebrews seems to be a sermon. Um, and uh, But most of these are letters. So um, the Gospels especially. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is an interesting one because when you look at the Gospel of Luke, um, Luke just writes this to one guy named Theophilus. Um, and that's kind of the whole thing, is that uh, it's just written for this one person. So, what do we actually find when we look at the Bible? Well, uh, we find that uh, it, was, um, it was written over this long period of time by all these different authors. And at the end of the day, uh, we say that the Bible is composed of 66 different books. You'll find 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. We call those testaments for a reason. Um, they, they testify to the work of God through the ages. Uh, God um, basically records the work that he did in human history in these testaments. And uh, Old Testament does not mean um, that it's outdated. <laughs> That's a lot of uh, the way people view that these days. But Old Testament really just means that this is the older version of what God did. This is the older testament of God's works in human history. And the New Testament would say is the newer testament to what God has done. Uh, you will find that both the Old Testament and the New Testament follow a very similar uh very similar pattern as far as their organization and structure is concerned. You'll see uh, in the Old Testament that it starts off with the law, or what they call Torah. Uh, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, all five books, what we call the Pentateuch, um, all five of those books form the basis for what will follow. Um, then you'll find the history books. Uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First uh, and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, all these different things, uh, leading up to the Book of Esther. Uh, all of these books are basically just history books, just telling us what the history of the Jewish people has been. Um, and then you'll find wisdom books. Uh, wisdom books kind of serve the purpose of helping us to better understand how to apply the law. Um, wisdom um, means that basically you have these facts, right? So in the law, you have a lot of different facts that God gives you. You have a lot of different things that God says, this is something that you need to do. But even with all of these different facts, there are some times where you'll encounter a situation and you think, I'm not really 100% sure what the right thing to do is in this situation. And that's where wisdom comes into play. Wisdom is being able to take the facts and information that you have and then interpret it uh, to apply to whatever your current situation is. So, um, uh, a lot later in the semester, we'll talk about morality and ethics. Um, so if somebody says, uh, for instance, something like um, fertilizing eggs, uh, fertilizing human eggs, and what they do, if you're in a, uh, if you're in a lab um, and somebody comes in and they say, uh, my wife and I are trying to get pregnant, um, We'd like to, uh, but I have a genetic condition, and I'd like to make sure that our child does not have that genetic condition. Well, what they'll do um, is they'll actually take some eggs and take some sperm, and they'll fertilize all of these and try to only pick out embryos that uh, do not have that particular genetic abnormality. And that one uh, that does not have a genetic abnormality will be the one that's implanted in the womb. Um, that actually results in something of an ethical question for uh, some Christians because they'll look at that and they'll say, well, um, as far as 
uh, Christianity is concerned, as far as conservative Christianity is concerned, um, you have given life to all of these. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it's like they're being kept from fully realizing life. Um, so there's kind of a question of, um, is that okay or is it not? Well, that's where wisdom comes into play. Um, wisdom is basically the application of our knowledge to different situations to see whether things are permissible or not. So, um, didn't mean to get into a whole lot of really deep stuff there, but uh, uh, that's just kind of hopefully a, a good example that'll help you kind of understand of what I'm talking about when I talk about wisdom. Then we get into, uh, at the end of the Old Testament, we have the major and the minor prophets. Each one of these um, looks forward to what is yet to come. Uh, they look forward to uh, a day when um, Messiah actually shows up. Um, hold on just a second. I'm going to pause this. Okay, sorry about that. I was getting a phone call. All right, so uh, we have talked through uh, pretty much what the Old Testament contains. Now let's look at the New Testament. So the New Testament... Uh, really kind of parallels uh, some of the contents of the Old Testament. We would say that uh, just as the Old Testament starts off with the law, uh, what we call the Torah, as it starts off with kind of these uh, basic instructions and understandings of uh, how God came into the world and, um, and interacted with humanity, so do the Gospels. The Gospels contain the story of how Jesus Christ entered into the world interacted with humanity, um, and did all of his ministry, uh, gave himself up, and rose again. That's all the stuff that we would say uh, kind of parallels what we find as the Old Testament begins as well. Then we find the history book. Uh, Acts of the Apostles is intended to be kind of the story of the early church. Just as the history books in the Old Testament will walk us through um, just how Israel went about uh, entering into the promised land and their time with kings and all these different things. Acts of the Apostles will talk about uh, how the church began to grow and expand and all kinds of stuff. Then we find the letters of Paul. And the letters of Paul uh, talk about kind of what it means for us now that Jesus has shown up. And they really do kind of act like wisdom books. Okay knowing that Jesus was here, how does that apply to my everyday life? That's kind of what Paul's letters are intended to be for us. Um, we, would, we would actually say that the other epistles, Hebrews and James and Jude and all those other things, probably fit pretty well with uh, the wisdom category as well in their own way. And then uh, the last of all is what we call an apocalypse. It's uh, Revelation. Um, Revelation is that book at the very end of the New Testament that intends for us to be able to look forward to uh, what God is going to do at the very end of all things. Um, it's a very complex book. If you look at um, some of the works of the prophets, they were pretty complex as well. Daniel is really complex. Ezekiel is really complex. And it's only now that we have seen a lot of things that they prophesied about come to pass that we can understand pretty well what they meant in some of those instances. The same kind of thing happens with Revelation. There are some things that we really didn't necessarily understand um, until they already took place. Um, and there are things that are still taking place, we would say, in the book of Revelation. So uh, it's a very interesting book in a number of ways. Uh, so you'll find all of these different things throughout the Bible, um, and all of them are, are intended to uh, work on us in different ways. Um, so one of the things that we get into, though, is a lot of people will raise issue with what's not necessarily in the Bible. Um, as we go through uh, Scripture, you'll find that... Um, certain things were intentionally omitted. And uh, they were omitted for particular reasons, especially when we look at the Old Testament. Some of the Old Testament books uh, that some would, would include 
are uh, things like First and Second Maccabees, uh, Book of Wisdom, Book of Tobit. Um, it, matter of fact, if you're Roman Catholic, you have these books. Uh, Roman Catholic Church has included all of these books as well. Um, and interestingly, uh, the church through history has agreed that, yes, these books are useful, um, but at least according to uh, one of the documents that we'll look at later on in the semester, was called the Didache, um, they were intended to be kind of on a different level than Scripture. Um, scripture is always primary, and then these books are viewed as, viewed as kind of supplementary to that. Uh, and they're supplementary because in some cases they contain things that are actually contrary to other parts of Scripture. And so... Um, the Jewish people actually were the keepers of the Old Testament, uh, and they themselves looked at these books and said, uh, there, are, there are hints of God there, but there are also ways in which uh, it seems to be that there's a lot of human influence in those books. So they're useful, but they're not considered to be on the same level as Scripture. Um, when we get into the New Testament, however, we get uh, a little bit of a variation there. Many books uh, are uh, considered uh, what we call Gnostic. Uh, Gnosticism was this movement uh, back in early Christianity uh, which basically said that there is some sort of secret knowledge that you can attain uh, if you just uh, read between the lines enough in Scripture. Um, and this was actually something that was condemned repeatedly throughout church history. Uh, the church has said, no, uh, God made it very clear what he was intending to say to us. Um, and so certain books uh, were written actually not by the people that they were claimed to have been written by. This was a common pra uh, practice by the Gnostics. Um, if you were a Gnostic, your goal was to take your understanding of this secret knowledge and make it something that would be acceptable um, to uh, the larger body of believers. You wanted to imbue your secret knowledge with greater authority. So, one of the things that they would do is they would write their books and then put somebody else's name on them. Um, so, when we get something like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or the Gospel of Thomas, those actually are not written by those people. Uh, these are things that were written by later people who were part of the movement called Gnosticism, uh, and they would uh, go through and put these people's names on their stuff. Um, it was actually a, a very common and accepted practice at the time. They didn't necessarily consider it to be uh, something that was some extraordinary lie or anything like that. It was just um, they felt like what they had written um, was supposed to have that kind of weight to it, as if it had been written by Mary Magdalene or Thomas or any of these people who had been really close to Christ himself. Um, so, why did we leave these things out of the New Testament? Well, because they were never really something that was accepted by the church in the first place. Um, part of what's interesting is as you look at early church history uh, and you get works from... Uh, early church fathers, uh, one guy was named uh, Irenaeus. Uh, you get uh, Origen, Tertullian, uh, St. Augustine. Uh, a lot of these really, really early guys in church history who lived in the 1 to 200s AD, um, they will actually talk about themselves, the books that, uh, that should be considered uh, scriptural. And these never really show up. Um, so that's part of the reason that we say that these Gnostic books were not intended to be uh, a part of the Bible from the very beginning. So why do we believe the Bible? Well, uh, first of all, because the Bible itself uh, seems to confirm itself. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, uh, Paul says, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So Paul says, look, when you received um, 
the word of God from us. Now he's actually talking about their preaching, but Paul, because he's preaching as an apostle, uh, is able to say that he's basically speaking uh, the word of God. Uh, and that this is something that is rooted in the Old Testament. That's one of the things that we always want to keep in mind is that um, these things that we find in the New Testament find their root in the Old Testament. That's part of why we still have the Old Testament as uh, a part of the Bible. Um, and even today, as we preach, we would say that somewhere in there, you are intended to hear God's word to you. Um, that's something that we carry on to this very day. Another thing that we see, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, this is what I've referred to earlier. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, Paul is looking at the Old Testament scriptures uh, and saying all of that stuff is uh, breathed out by God. But at the same time, um, scripture is still being written at his uh, in his day. So uh, we do have reason to believe, uh, especially because of the way that he himself refers to his own words earlier in 1 Thessalonians, we have reason to believe that he would understand the New Testament scriptures to be breathed out by God as well. Um, you'll get into, uh, a lot of times people will get into debates about what 2 Timothy 3.16 actually means when it says God breathed. Um, and some will interpret that verse to say um, that Scripture is just something that has some divine inspiration to it, um, but can also be flawed. Um, at least in my studies, uh, according to the work that I have done, uh, I don't see that as being the understanding that is intended to be present there. Um, quite literally, it sounds to me like Paul is saying that Scripture is breathed out by God. It is, it is what God himself has said. So uh, that's part of why we look at the Bible so highly. Um, uh, finally, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Uh, we in Christianity would hold that the Bible is a very unique book in this sense. That um, the Bible is something that um, it looks at us and it, it kind of, there are ways in which it makes us uncomfortable. Um, because, for instance, if I look at Scripture and I go, uh, well, this is talking about my own personal sin struggle. Uh, that doesn't really make me feel all that good. Uh, but it's something that helps me to, to see myself more honestly um, and helps me to be more humble. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of different things that apply there um, when we read Scripture. So, um, so that's part of why we say that the Word of God is, is living and active, that uh, we would say when we look at Scripture, it 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 looks at us as well um, in kind of an oddball way. Um, and a lot of us find that to be the case. Uh, one of the things that we find, uh, there's a, a book called The Doctrine of the Word of God um, that is very interesting. John Frame says, Divine authorship is the ultimate reason why Scripture is authoritative. Its authority is absolute because God's authority is absolute. And Scripture is His personal word to us. As Paul says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Not just those parts that we find attractive, cogent, relevant, or culturally respectable. Um, I had an older lady in my congregation several years ago who was a, a very sweet lady. And, uh, and she said, you know, the Bible should make me uncomfortable. She said, because I'm not perfect. And as long as I'm not perfect, God is still working on me. And so I should still uh, have things within me uh, that need to change. And if that's the case, uh, then, um, then Scripture should speak to me in that way. So that's kind of, uh, I found that to be a very helpful thing 
uh, really just for me personally. All right, a couple other things. Uh, a couple things that you're going to need to know going forward. First of all, uh, you need to know the term doctrine. A doctrine is something that we have basically discerned from Scripture. Uh, it is a teaching or a belief about something. Uh, it's um, usually about a complex theological concept. So when we talk about the Trinity, the Bible does not use the word Trinity. But we will also find that the overarching message of Scripture um, lends to the idea that God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why we would say uh, that he would be considered uh, triune. We would also look at something like free will. Um, scripture may not explicitly talk about free will, but the idea of free will is all over the Bible. Um, so sometimes we get these ideas um, that we can clearly discern when we read Scripture, but they just may not be spelled out word for word. So that's what we consider to be a doctrine. Swan talks about this and says that a doctrine is a belief held by a group of persons, which is an extension or explanation of the dogma. And we'll talk about dogma as well. Dogma is often used to indicate an accepted truth considered beyond dispute. So something like the existence of God. Uh, we as Christians would say uh, that, that the existence of God is just kind of uh, an accepted thing. We just understand that to be the case. And other things flow out of that dogma. Um, so, a uh, uh, couple more things. Uh, as we go through this course, you will hear me use the word orthodox a lot. Um, because we uh, want to understand what is the right understanding according to the church. Um, according to Christianity historically, what is the right understanding of uh, these different doctrines? So uh, somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, um, I think Jesus was uh, a human being and nothing more. Um, uh, that's very much contrary to what the church teaches, and it's very much contrary to what we would hold that the Bible has to say. Um, but... It's actually been something that has been disputed throughout church history. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are following, because this is a Christian beliefs course, we want to make sure that we're following with what the uh, accepted position is according to the universal church. So that's what, we, what we're talking about when we talk about orthodoxy. Um, so you will a lot of times hear me say, this group would hold this to be the case, but the orthodox position is this. Um, the uh, such and such group would say that Jesus was human and nothing more, but we would say that Christ has two natures, one divine and uh, one human. You'll also hear me talk about uh, what is heterodox. I don't use that term as much, mostly because um, it can be very confusing. Uh, I want you to hear uh, orthodoxy most of all. But if we talk about something that is heterodox or heretical or heresy, um, what we're saying is that that is the opposite of what the church teaches. That is an incorrect doctrine. So, um, so uh, when we are in class, we're going to be talking about uh, biblical interpretation and... Um, the goal is that we would arrive at uh, certain theological conclusions uh, which are consistent with the biblical message. We want to avoid heresy uh, because that's something that will lead us farther and farther away uh, from what we would understand to be the truth of Christianity. And the second thing is when we interpret according to sound practice, we drastically reduce our chances of reaching heretical conclusions. Um, as long as you are following what is uh, a good method of biblical interpretation, you drastically reduce your chances of coming up with ideas that are not uh, accurate according to Scripture. So, uh, one of the most basic issues that we have is that people will read things, uh, what we say, 
eisegetically, meaning that they read into the text rather than pulling from the text what its meaning is. We'll talk about some of that uh, as we talk about your biblical interpretation assignment. Um, but we want to read exegetically, which means that we pull meaning from the text rather than reading our own meaning into it. Um, when I am in conversation with my wife, um, sometimes I will say something one way and she hears it a completely different way uh, than what I meant. That, uh, and so my wife is also uh, in theology, and I'll, I'll tell her sometimes, okay, you're hearing me eisegetically, and I want you to hear me exegetically. Hear what I'm actually saying rather than reading meaning into what I'm trying to tell you. So, um, okay, that's what I've got for you this week. Uh, I'll see you in the online classroom.